One thing Alyssa forgot to mention in the announcements, it's not in your bulletin, um, and it won't be in your bulletin next week either because it's already been made, um, but next Sunday after afternoon around 4.30 or so, um, 4, actually we'll say 4, 4 o'clock next Sunday, um, we're going to go ahead and take down Christmas stuff. We were debating whether we should just leave it up all year. Um, it would just be easier, but several people said that we should probably take it down, and so we are going to do that next Sunday. We're going to leave it up through New Year's. Um, and if you can't handle that and can't handle the lights being on, I'm sorry. Um, it's going to be okay because I know some people, like, day after Christmas, it's got to come down. Um, we're going to keep it up just since we put a lot of work into it. We'll enjoy it a little bit longer. So next Sunday at 4, um, if you can help with that, it should go a lot quicker than putting up. Typically, Teardown does, and so that'll be good. Today we're going to start a new series called The Good Work. And throughout this series, we're going to look at the book of Nehemiah. And this is going to be a lot like the book of Daniel, which we um, got done studying and looking at a few weeks ago. And this is kind of a continuation of, of Daniel to an extent, and hopefully you'll see um, what I'm talking about in just a little bit as we look at this. But I love this because when we looked at Daniel, we looked at lots of stories about how he had a lot of faith, right? And how he, he had, him and his friends had incredible faith when it came to um, following the Lord and doing what the Lord expected and called him to do. Uh, Nehemiah is a lot like that. He has a lot of faith. Um, I'm not saying Daniel wasn't a doer, but Nehemiah understood that there was an importance of doing good work um, and continuing. Yes, faith is great, um, like James talks about, but without works, without doing good works, it's dead, right? That's what James says. And so our works are a product of our faith. And like I said, I'm not saying Daniel wasn't a doer and didn't do good works because he did, but I love the, the focus of Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah is an Old Testament book. It's 13 chapters long. I would encourage you to read it um, at some point. We're going to be looking at this for, I think, four weeks um, is the plan. And so I would encourage you to read through it. It's not hard. It's a, it's a really cool um, book, and the, the life of Nehemiah is really cool. And so I want to start off today by saying that if you're the best of the best, you're like the best in your class, uh, you graduated number one in high school or college, like you're the greatest person around, God can use you, I promise he can use you. But as we look at Nehemiah, you're going to see that God uses ordinary people, right? And we've talked about that before. God, all throughout scripture, God uses everyday people like you and I. Like I said, you might be the best. I am not. I was not number one um, in high school. I wasn't even, I might have been in the top half. I don't know. But I was not a great student. I was a mediocre athlete. I was not like the best of anything. But God uses ordinary people like me. I'll say like me. That way I'm not saying you're not the, the best of the best. Um, but God uses ordinary people like me and like Nehemiah um, to do some huge things. And so I truly believe that God created us for a purpose, right? And it's our job to figure out what that purpose is. Our purpose is to do what he has already told us to do. Um, but sometimes he gives us a specific purpose. And so it's our job to figure out what that is and then to follow through and to be obedient and to do it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of our job. And he uses everyday people. And so my prayer throughout this whole series is that if you don't know what your purpose is, that you'd figure it out um, if you haven't already, but also to, to understand that you are, created to God, you are created by God to do something way bigger than like your everyday job, way bigger than um, your, your everyday stuff, but to do something that, that has an eternal purpose, right? To, to do something, that's, uh, something that matters, something that lasts, something um, that's bigger than you can imagine. Right? That's what God has created us to do. And so my, my encouragement is for you to start thinking about this um, this week and then as we continue um, to be thinking about what, what God has called you to do, what the, what, what's the good work God has called you to do. And so um, I'm hoping that as the next four weeks, someone in here will become open to that. They'll become open to understanding or saying, God, what is it? Maybe you've never thought about this, saying, God, God, what is it you want me to do? Like I'm this old, and I, I've never really thought about this this much, but what is it that you have me here for? Um, what's my eternal purpose? Like, why am I here on this earth? Um, what is the good work that I should be doing? And so hopefully some of you, maybe even just one of you, whoever, um, will think about that stuff. And I want to warn you, and we've warned you a lot about this, but when you start following God, when you start doing the things of God, um, there's going to be trials, right? There's going to be pain involved in that because uh, people don't always understand. Uh, you might experience agony, rejection, heartache, uh, failure every now and then, right? When you, there's times in, the, in Scripture when people tried to do what God asked them to do, 
and they failed at it, right? And so, and so they have to rely on God some more and figure out what, what they need to do next, and they, they go and do again what God asked them to do. Um, so there could, be fail, there could be failure involved in discouragement, disappointments, all kinds of things um, when you start seeking the Lord and doing uh, what he asked you to do. But here's the deal. When you sacrifice, it impacts another person's life, right? When, it, when it, your sacrifice impacts another person's life and honors God, it's worth the cost of all the pain, right? Anybody experience this? When you, when you do what God calls you to do and you've experienced some pain because of it, and you start to realize that people's lives can be changed, and you're honoring God, it's worth that pain, right? It's worth that struggle. Does anybody ever experience that? I have, for sure, um, a few of you. Um, and so hopefully more people will get to know that and, and understand what that means and how that looks in your own life. And so you might look like an ordinary, everyday person. You might not feel exceptionally gifted or talented, um, but you're the exact same type of person that God uses and wants to use and will continue to use because uh, he started in scripture and he continues to do it. And so Nehemiah, you're going to see that he has a broken heart for his people and the problems they were facing during this time. And so he looked at their, their situation, the situation of his people, of his family, um, of, the, of the place that he came from, which we're going to talk about. And he decided he couldn't sit by and do nothing, which is a huge deal, right? There are times in our lives when we see a situation, maybe in our community, uh, maybe in our church, and we think, man, somebody should do something, right? Anybody ever had that thought? Like, somebody should do something. And then you're like, but wait a minute, like, it's not me. Like, somebody else should do something. Like, I, that, that's not for me. Somebody else should fix this. Um, I, when I think about that, I think of uh, the Street Reach Ministries in Memphis. Like, uh, Pastor Tim, and again, I, hopefully one day you guys will all meet him, but he, he kind of talks about how, how they got started in their, in their mission, and he talks about how all these people are like, he keeps saying somebody should do something about this, and he finally came to this point where he realized, like, that somebody might be him, which can be kind of scary, right? And so the same thing applies to us today. Um, that same somebody, when we're looking at these situations, and we think, man, somebody should do something that somebody is probably us if we have that, if we see that there's a need there. And so today, uh, the reason we're calling this the good work is because in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, which we're going to look at the story in a little bit, but it says, so they began the good work. And so that's the theme of the series. And today we're going to be talking about when you can't take it anymore and how that looks for us and kind of what that means. And so Nehemiah was an ordinary guy from the Old Testament, and he made a huge difference. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a warrior. He was just this plain old guy, um, an everyday guy who was uh, at the time serving the king. And he heard the situation in the story from a brother of his, and it broke his heart, and it burdened him so much uh, that he had to do something about it. And so we're going to look at this story. Uh, if you don't know what Nehemiah did for a living, some of you have no idea, and that's great um, because you're about to learn. He was a cupbearer. And so what that means is basically in our in our world today, that would look like a butler or a servant or somebody like that, serving the king. He was, he was with the king all the time. Um, it took a lot of trust. Nehemiah was trusted by the king. It was King Artaxerxes at the time. Um, he was trusted. He was, um, he was loyal to the king. He had a lot of integrity because you've got to imagine if he's serving the king and he, he's with the king all the time, there's going to be times when the king is maybe planning the next war, who they're going to attack or who they're going to be attacked by, whatever, and, and Nehemiah is going to hear these things, right? And so he has to be trusted because he needs to keep his mouth shut. Um, there has to be some confidentiality there. Uh, if, if Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, um, if the king is talking um, trash about one of his people, like making fun of his people, because kings might do that, I don't know, um, but they're making fun of it, Nehemiah is going to hear it, right? And so he's got to keep his mouth shut so he doesn't get in trouble. And, and so he, he was really trusted, he was really loyal, and he understood the importance of, of following and doing what the king had asked him to do. The problem was this wasn't the, the most important part of his job, so he had to have all those things, but uh, the most important part of his job, cupbearer, means that he was basically the one who would, when the wine would come or the food would come to the king, he would try it first because there's always plots to kill the king so that people could overthrow the kingdom, right? And so Nehemiah as a cupbearer would try the food, try the wine uh, before the king did, to make sure it wasn't poisoned, which is pretty crazy, right? Like, I would not want that job. And if you had that job, you better have good life insurance because it just takes, like, one time for it to go bad, right? And then he's gone. Uh, but so he was trusted, and he understood uh, what his job was. And so, like I said, I wouldn't want that job. But one day, Nehemiah is having a, a normal day, 
and he has this conversation with someone that moves him to a place where he'd never been before. And we're going to see how this goes starting in chapter, or chapter 1, verse 2. And it should be on the screen. It says, Hananiah, one of my brothers, this is Nehemiah talking, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And we're going to pause right there real quick. So we're having this, they're having this conversation about Nehemiah and his brother are having this conversation about their people from Jerusalem, right? And so he's saying, tell me, about, tell me about our homeland, what's going on. And so the reason Nehemiah is asking about this, and this is how it has to do with Daniel, if you remember, this, I know this takes Nehemiah, if you open your Bibles or have them, it's before the book of Daniel, but the Bible isn't in chronological order. Um, and so this is happening like 140 years or so, roughly, after what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar when he overthrew Jerusalem, right? In the book of Daniel, you see Daniel was taken captive, and we talked about all that. And so this is how it, it, it's a continuation of what was going on. And so that happened in 586 BC. And just a quick refresher, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebi as we refer to him as, uh, he, he destroyed the whole city, he destroyed the temple, he destroyed the future of the city by, by taking the, the young men and training them up in his own ways. Uh, and he, he took the people captive, right? And so we're now 140 years later, and the people are still struggling, which is crazy, right? You think, I mean, that's a whole, that's like multiple generations. Like, that's probably like two or three generations later uh, that that's, this has taken place. And so it's crazy to me. But now you have 50,000 Jews or so that have moved back to Jerusalem and they're wanting to rebuild it. So 140 years roughly later, these Jews are moving back to Jerusalem to rebuild it and they're just having a heck of a time, right? They just can't do it. It's like they're, they're stuck at the end of a dead end road um, and they're just not being very productive and they can't get the things done that they need to get done. And so it continues in verse three, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And so why does this matter? Why do the gates matter? Because that's their protection in and out of the city, right? And so they're no longer protected and they can't protect themselves um, from their enemies or anything like that. And so they have a lot, a lot of problems. And so what do you do when when you don't know what to do. These people literally had no direction. They didn't know what to do. Uh, and we are in the same situation so many times, right? We, we see a problem. We see a burden like Nehemiah saw, and we don't know what to do. We start to question, like, like I mean, what, what can we do? We know there's a need, but we just absolutely don't know what to do. And what do you do when something breaks your heart and you know there's work that needs to be done? Like I said earlier, a lot of times we say, man, somebody needs to do something, right? Instead of saying, maybe I'm that person to do something. What do you do when you see something that bothers you so much that you can't take it anymore? And so th this morning we're going to talk about three, three things that Nehemiah did that we, we can learn from, I think. And this is how we begin our good work and we're going to continue this series. Um, but this morning we're going to be talking about how we continue our good work when we can't take it anymore. And so the first thing we see Nehemiah do in response to his brother's news that he brought him um, is the same thing we may end up doing sometimes in our lives. Uh, something I've done more so than I would care to admit, but um, this, is, this is what Nehemiah does. If you look at Nehemiah 1 verse 4, it says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so the first thing he does is he sits down and weeps, right? He, he cries about it. He's so burdened by what's going on, by the injustice uh, going on in his city. But the same thing happens to us, right? We see problems. We see issues in our community. We see issues in the church, in our country, in our world. And we think, man, that's, that's terrible. That's horrible. Just like Nehemiah thought. Uh, but so many times we just kind of put it on the back burner, right? We, we don't let it in. We don't really let it into our heart. Uh, because if we do, then what happens? We should probably do something, right? Like if we're actually going to care about it so much that we, we become burdened about it, we should probably do something about it. And so it's interesting to me to think about where Nehemiah was when he heard the news because he was about a thousand miles away um, from what I understand from Jerusalem and from his homeland. And he was, he was living a good life, right? He was comfortable. He was living with the king. He was eating the same food as the king. He was, uh, when, when the king was watching a football game on his 4K TV, like he was there watching it right? Nobody? Okay. Um, sorry, whatever. Um, but thank you for laughing, Loretta. I'm going to pick on you today somehow. Um, but he was enjoying it. He was loving his life. He was probably taking selfies, saying hashtag blessed to serve, like things like that. Um, I don't know what he was doing, but he was having a good life. And all of a sudden he has this big burden for, for his people and for Jerusalem. And so he was an ordinary person, 
not in a role of status, but in the role of a servant attending the needs of the king. And so one day Nehemiah is having a normal day and he, and he, he hears this news and he has this big old burden uh, for his people. And so what does he do? He understands that somebody has to do something and he could be like us. He could have been like, man, it's just not my place. I'm really far away. Uh, I just can't. I just can't go about doing that. I'm living a comfortable life. Um, sometimes when I, when I watch the news, I, I see things, I see a natural disaster, and I think to myself, man, that's horrible. Uh, I can pray for that real quick, like, right? That's like the easiest response, even though a lot of us don't even do that. Um, but we can say, man, God be with that situation. But then I kind of stop it there, right? Because I don't, like, I can't get involved. Like, it takes money to get involved. Like, it takes time to get involved. Uh, and Nehemiah could have said all those things, right? It took it was gonna, he was going to give up his, his comfortable life um, to be helping his people. And so he, he had a lot, of, a lot of decisions to make. And he had a choice. And he, he could acknowledge the problem of his people and say, man, that's too bad. What a shame. I hate to hear that. Uh, I feel bad for them, but my life's okay, right? My life's fine here. I'm living a good life. Uh, things are going well. I need to be here for the king. But he, he let this news, not just in his head, like we often do, but he let it in his heart, right? Nehemiah let the news in his heart, and he had a burden for his people. And so he, he began, he sat down, and he cried, and he, he broke down and he, because he had such a burden. And so I would encourage you, I would ask your, yourself this, what breaks your heart? Like, think about this. For, I mean, as we're, as we're starting this series, um, this is really basic stuff, but what, what breaks your heart? Like, think, and if something doesn't break your heart, like, that's concerning, right? If things aren't, aren't like, getting emotional within, within you about situations, whether it's a family member, a, a family situation, a community situation, whatever it is, like if that's not affecting your heart, like that's not a good thing. Like you should be seeking the Lord in that because God, God expects it to, right? God expects our hearts to be broken for the things that break his heart, right? Like that's a big deal. Like he, he wants us to care for the oppressed. Um, and so maybe just some examples. Maybe it's hurting children. Maybe it's uh, children who can't read or those who have special needs. Like maybe that's what a burden is for you. Um, and I don't know what the solution looks like for these things, but um, these are just some suggestions for you. Maybe it's those who, are, who have been bullied or neglected or abused. Uh, maybe it's those who are bound by an addiction, right? People, I mean, look at this community, every community. It's not just this. It's literally every community. Um, drug addictions, pornography addictions, um, addictions to anything and everything, like huge deal, right? If that stuff, uh, we, get so, we get so desensitized to that stuff, right? It's just a normal thing. We begin to think, oh, it's not a big deal. Everybody struggles with it. It's a huge deal, right? It goes against uh, what God expects and what God, God wants. Uh, it could be homelessness. Anybody ever seen a homeless person in Paris? Absolutely, right? There's homeless people in our town. And so that could be your burden, that could be what you're, you're going to the Lord about and crying about and upset about. Uh, those who have been trafficked or abused their whole lives, maybe um, if you think about other countries, those who don't have clean drinking water. Like blows my mind for us to, to talk about that because there's so many days that I never, it never even crosses my mind that there are people in this world that don't have clean drinking water. But what can I do, right? Like how can I help that? Well, we can give. There's lots of organizations, um, good Christian organizations that that help provide clean water to people. And so that's us having a burden have, for those people, crying for those people, um, and then doing what Nehemiah did and, and continuing the good work. Uh, there, did you know there's Bible poverty in the world, right? There's some languages, people uh, that don't have the Bible written in their native language. They literally cannot understand the word of God because it's not in their language. And so there are organizations and groups uh, that work on that and strive to get it reached to every single nation in every language. Um, so it's a huge deal, right? Those are things we should be burdened for, the things of God we should be burdened for. And so we need to, I want you to start thinking in these weeks to come, uh, what are you burdened for? And if you, if you don't know, I would challenge you just to say, God, break my heart. Uh, help me to see with your eyes, right? Help me to see the things the way you see things. Because there's so many times, like I said, we just get so desensitized and we, we think everything's normal. Um, and it's not. It's not what God intended and it's not what God what God desires. And so I would encourage you just to take some time, dedicate some time, even this week, just to say, God, like, what do I need to be crying for? I'm not saying you have to literally uh, start bawling your eyes out, but what do you need to have a burden for, right? Some of you are like, man, I don't cry. I'm so tough. I'm never going to cry, uh, whatever. And then others are like me, like, just cry for no reason. Don't, can't explain it. Don't understand it. Um, but it just starts coming. Like, I, I joke so many times, 
Some of you can laugh, maybe, I don't know. Um, I've joked so many times with my mom, I always made fun of her for crying. Hopefully she doesn't watch this. Um, but now, like, she's even to the point she cries on the way to church. I'm like, what are you crying about? Like, I don't go to church with her, obviously, anymore. Um, but I'd be like, what are you crying about? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, she's just emotional because she's going to church. And I'm like, so now I'm like driving to church. I'm like, oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Like, it's coming. So, yeah. So maybe you're like me, whatever. Life goes on. Sorry, I'm like that. So we need, to, we need to take some time crying and being burdened, letting stuff in our heart instead of just our head. The second thing that Nehemiah did in verse 4, if you look at it again, it says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And then it says, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Uh, what does it mean to fast? During this time, mostly fasting meant giving up your food uh, for a certain amount of time and dedicating that time, whatever time you were giving to eating, um, giving that time to the Lord and just saying, Lord, uh, be with whatever situation. So for Nehemiah, he's praying for his people um, and kind of asking God what he should be doing. And so listen to me, if it's big enough to cry about, the issue is big enough to cry about, some of you have cried about situations, then it's big enough to pray about, right? And Nehemiah understood that and he cries out to God. And if you look at verse five, it says, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear my prayer or to hear the prayer of your servant. Hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And so Nehemiah is basically just praying to God saying, God, please hear my prayer, right? Anybody ever feel like that? There's times when I'm praying, I'm like, God, are you listening? Like, please just hear my prayer. Please listen to what I'm saying. Um, but the reality is we know he is, right? His, his promises are true and he and he says he, he hears us, and so we know that he's listening. We know that he's attentive. attentive. But if you, if you watch Nehemiah's prayer, and you read on, he confesses. Uh, if you have your scriptures, we're not going to look at it on the screens. But if you read on it, he confesses his own sin. And then he confesses the sins of his people. So not only is he saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Uh, I messed up. Please listen to me. But then he says, I know we as a people have sinned. I know we've messed up. Um, and so we also need to pray for the sins of others sometimes, right? Whether it's your family um, our country, whatever, just saying, God, like, please forgive us for our sins, not just for me um, and my sins. But, and then he reminds God of his promises and he reminds God of his faithfulness, um, which I don't think God needs that reminder, but he does so anyways. And so after he mourned and he fasted and he prayed, he goes on uh, before the king and he asks permission uh, to the king. And he basically says, king, I honor you. Um, I, I, I'm loyal to you. I trust you. Like, I know that you have the power, the ability to do what you're going to do. Um, but he knows, he knows, and he tells the king that his heart is with his people, and he has this burden. And so in verse 11, you'll see him pray again, and he says this. He says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And so he's about to go to the king saying, Lord, please show me favor in front of this man, the king has absolutely no obligation to let Nehemiah go, right? You guys understand that. Like, the king could care less probably about Jerusalem. He could probably care less about his servant, Nehemiah. Uh, but he trusted him, and he knew that he was loyal. And so he had, no, he had no obligation. But as you read Nehemiah, you watch him pray over and over and over. And, and the thing you have to understand is this is, there's several prayers. I think there's actually 12 in the book of Nehemiah um, that Nehemiah offers. But just because there is 12 probably means there's literally hundreds or thousands of times when Nehemiah prayed. And they were, most of the time, there were these short things that were quick. Uh, it wasn't him on his knees, like praying for hours on end, because he knew what God wanted him to do, right? If you know what God wants you to do, like, you don't need to say, man, I'm going to pray about that and see. Like, right? People say that, right? Like, like they'll, they'll say, man, I just feel like God's telling me to do this. And it will be something that, like, he's already told us to do in Scripture. And then I'll, like, say something. They'll be like, oh, I really need to pray about whether I'm going to do that or not. I'm like, no, you don't. Like, he's already told you to do it over and over and over, right? And so I just, just so you know, don't be that person and say that. And so you see Nehemiah praying over and over, and he believes in the goodness and the glory of God. And so one thing I love about him, one thing I love about Nehemiah is that he's, he's basically a leadership genius, and we're going to look at it. He's practical. He studies. Uh, he strategizes. He, he casts visions. He delegates. Um, he's a leadership genius, but he still relies on the faith of God, right? He, he relies on that and understands the importance of it. And so that's why you see him so many times praying uh, these quick prayers before he goes, goes and does what he's going to do. And so how do you begin the good work when you can't take it anymore? You let it into your heart and you sit down and cry, but then you also 
um, spend some time praying about it, and you, you spend some time seeking the goodness of God. And so the third thing you do is you stand up and act. And this is uh, going to be also illustrated in, in verse, chapter 2, verse 4. Um, not 1-4, but 2-4. And so Nehemiah takes the cup and he goes to visit the king and his heart's heavy and the king can tell it. And so in verse uh, 4 of chapter 2, it says, The king said to me, what is it you want? So he walks in with the cup and the king can recognize something's wrong with Nehemiah because he's, he's so uh, heartbroken for his people. And he says, what is it that you want? And then you watch him again. He says a little a prayer, I'll call it a flare prayer. Um, he says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. So it doesn't say he like got on his hands and knees and prayed to the God of heaven, uh, but he just prayed real quick, God be with me. Um, and then he answers the king and he says, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And so he, he presents this request to the king. And like I said, uh, he has no obligation. The king has absolutely no obligation um, to let him go. The, the people are hurting there. The walls are down. Um, the city's exposed. And basically, Nehemiah understands that he can't take it anymore, right? I, I have to do something. And so that's where we, that's hopefully we as a church uh, will at some point, and we as individuals at some point, will get to that point in our lives, right? Like, I just cannot take this anymore. I can't sit here and do nothing, right? I have to do something about it. And that's, that's where, where God wants us. That's what God expects us um, to do. And so we have to stand up and act. And, and like I said, this isn't a minor request. This was a huge request because the king, I mean, the king could have got mad and killed Nehemiah because he's like, no, you're not going nowhere. Like you're, you're here to serve me. This is your job. Um, you're not going to do it. But Nehemiah understood that somebody needed to do it um, and it needed to be him. And so I, I, I love this because it would have been so easy. It would have been so easy for Nehemiah, like I've said over and over, um, just to say, I'm not going to do it. Like somebody else, my brothers are here. They're reporting. I can tell my brothers what to do. They can go back and, and do the work for me, right? I can continue doing what I've always done. But he knew that he was the man um, to do the work. And he knew that, that it was his job. And so I would, I would challenge you to be thinking about, so not only what your burden is for people or to have a burden for people, but then, but then what do you need to do? How, how do you need to stand up and act to pray for those people? But then how do you, how do you stand up and act in, in this situation, in your situation? Um, there's so many things. We make so many excuses. And, and I truly believe that there's somebody uh, in here this morning that, that instead of keeping something, a situation at a distance, you're hopefully these next few weeks um, are going to make a decision to say, God, I'm going to let it in, right? I'm going to let this bother me a little bit because we're people who like want to be comfortable, right? We don't want any like heartache. We don't want any pain in our life. Like we're, we're in America. We live in a good country. Like we just don't want, we don't want any trouble, right? We don't want to endure any pain. That's why like the second somebody, and I'm not picking on anybody, but the second you have a headache, you take a ibuprofen, right? Like it's okay to have a little bit of pain. Like you don't need medicine. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that for every, like for a hangnail, right? Like, do you need medicine for a hangnail? Some of you do, right? Some of you be crying about it after church about your hangnail and you're like, I'm not going to take medicine because pastor said not to, but it hurts so bad. Like, I just can't take it, right? Like, no, it's okay. Like to have a little bit of pain. I promise you it'll be okay. Um, and so, and that's how we grow, right? God talks about we grow through our pain. And so I would encourage you, I don't even know where I was going. I got off on the hangnail thing. Um, but we make so many excuses about how we just don't want to let things in. Um, and so I would just challenge you to stop making excuses about, man, this is going to call it, like if I get involved in this, I have no resources. I have no money, extra money to give to this. I, I don't even know where I would begin. Uh, I don't, we can't, we can't be around people right now, right? Because of COVID, you just can't do that. Like, so that's a good excuse. Um, whatever, right? The, the excuses go on and on and on right? Why we can't get involved in these situations, why we can't have a burden. And so we just move on. But I would challenge you, like I said, um, to understand that that's not the way God intended uh, for it to be. And so many times we say, man, I'm, I'm not the pastor. Like that's the pastor's job, right? I, I, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe what God says. And I, I believe I should do what he says, but, but I'm, I'm not called like the pastor's called, right? I'm telling you right now, like a calling by a person is pointless. Like I don't care if anybody approves like what God's called you to do, right? It doesn't matter. It matters what God's asked you to do. Do you understand that? Like, it doesn't matter if you've called me to be the pastor, as long as God calls me to be the pastor, like that's what matters to me. Like, it doesn't matter what you guys think 
as far as that goes, because we're, we're here to please God and to do what God's asked us to do. And so you have to understand that you don't have to be appointed by man or woman if you're, if you're called by God. You don't have to be chosen by people if God prompts your heart or gives you a burden for things. You can do it. Like, it doesn't matter if you have the resources. It doesn't matter uh, if, you, if you feel adequate. Like, if God asks you to do something, you now have the ability to do something, which is pretty cool, right? Uh, I love that, that God even, even is using this king that Nehemiah is serving because he had no obligation, but Nehemiah was doing what God asked, right? And so now this door, even though King Artaxerxes wasn't following the Lord, this door is now open because of Nehemiah, because Nehemiah is doing what God's asked him to do, and because Nehemiah is seeking the Lord in that. And so now these doors open, right? And doors begin to open when you say, God, I have this burden for this situation, for these people, for this family, for whatever it is, and God will, and I'm going to do something, right? I'm going to be the person to do it. When you say, Lord, I'm going to be the person to do it, guess what? It's easy, right? God makes it easy. He figures it out, and he, he paves the way ahead of you. And so it's a, a bold decision for us to ask, but we need to ask God. Uh, we need to ask God and seek God and a, just ask him to help us to be burdened for people, uh, to spend some time praying for people. And it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out thing. Maybe you need to fast. That's great. Maybe you don't need to fast. Uh, because if he's giving you the burden, it's probably something he wants you to do. And so just stand up, be bold, um, and ask God. And so this week, as this is, that's this week, right? So we need to we need to understand that there's, there's people hurting. There's situations that need help, right? And we're, we could be the people to do it. And so we need to have a burden. We need to be praying for people. And then not only do we need to do that, we need to probably do the most important thing. Um, and that's to actually follow through and do something. Uh, there's so many times people, and I, I pray for this as, a, as our church, there's so many times people say, man, I just wish we were doing more. I want to do something else. I'm like, let's do it. Like, just tell me what it is. Because I, like, I don't have the same burdens that you have. And so as a church, like if you have a burden for people, like let me know. Like I'll be the first one in line to go do whatever we're doing. Like I'll, I'll help you figure it out the best that I can. Um, there's lots of people that have different resources, right? That's the beauty of the church, right? So there's people in here that are good at things that other people are not good at. Um, and so we'll figure that out. So as we continue through these weeks, if you have a burden for something and you, and you feel like God is saying, man, you need to say this to somebody, then say it to me right? We'll do this as a church. I, I pray that we look different um, throughout all of this, throughout this pandemic, throughout this year, throughout whatever. Like, I pray that we don't look like the world. Like, I'm so tired of looking like everybody else as a church. Like, it's pathetic to an extent, right? We, we should be living different. We should be looking different. We should be talking different um, than everybody else, and we're guilty of not doing it, right? We're guilty of looking um, like everybody else. And so, um, as we close, and as I pray, and as Matthew and Bailey come up here. They're going to lead us in spirit, lead me this morning. Um, and that's our prayer, that, that the Holy Spirit will lead us in whatever we're burdened for, whatever situation we need to be burdened for. If we, um, we, we need to, this morning, just be praying and asking God to give us his eyes. I think that's where we start. Um, and just for us to see the things that maybe we haven't seen. Maybe it's our neighbor that we've lived next to for our whole lives, and, and we've never really solved their problems, the issues, um, but maybe this week we'll see it. Maybe we'll say, God, show me the, the burden, whatever I need, um, and we'll see that thing, and then we'll start from there. And so I'm going to pray, and if you need prayer, I'll be up here. If you want to pray on the altar, um, you're welcome to, of course, uh, but most importantly, just pray that God will lead us in all this, and, and not, I don't want to take this lightly. Like, if I come up here every single week and preach, and you guys go home, and then next week I said, what did I preach about last week, and you have no idea, like, I'm wasting my time, and it's not fun. Like, I'm already not having the greatest amount of fun, and so please don't make me waste my time. Um, I'll shut up now. Um, but please don't make me waste my time. Like, I really want us to, to move towards where God wants us as a church. Like, that's, that's my biggest desire. And so I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for, again, this day, and just for, for Nehemiah and the example that he was, and just the, the boldness that he had to approach the king, Lord. And so we, we are approaching a different king. We're approaching you, Father, but... But we know that you'll open doors when we, uh, when we ask. And so, Father, help us to, to recognize the issues around us. Help us to have burdens for people. And, Lord, if our hearts are so hard that, that we no longer are burdened for people, Lord, uh, break our hearts. And I don't care what you do to do it, Lord, just do it. Because we, we want the heart that you have, and we want to see the needs that you see, and we want to have the, the ears and the, um, just everything that you hear and see and do, Lord, we want. And so, Father, help us to, 
to have broken hearts and, and to spend some time crying um, or just having a burden for people. And then, Lord, help us to seek you and figure out what our, what our role is in those situations and how we, can, how we can go and move forward. And, Lord, most importantly, help us to, to stand up and act the way Nehemiah did. And, Father, I just ask that you be with our church. Help us not just to be consumers where we come here every single week, um, listen to your word, and then go home and do nothing. Uh, Lord, help us to, to be doers and to, to go about and do things in this community. Help us to look different than everybody else. Help us to um, do more than, than most people see and uh, to do more than most people are experiencing right now, Father. And I just uh, pray all these things in your name. Amen.